Okay, yeah, we will have another uh, session uh, for, for the, sec uh, the second sharing. Yeah, our guest presenter, Marco P uh, Paladino, yeah, who, who is the CTO of the co-founder of the Kong. Yeah, but um, he's still in the travel at this moment, so he cannot uh, attend our live sharing right now. But luckily, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, he's so helpful to record a video to us to share the topic, how to share, uh, 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 achieve zero trust security with the Karma. Karma is a, one of the uh, surface mesh product at this moment. Yeah, yeah, this is quite common, it's quite famous uh, on the balcon. So I think that we will wait one more minute first. Yeah, we will have, a, we will play the video. Hi everybody. Today we're going to be talking about zero trust security, which is a new pattern that is more and more required when developing microservices. My name is Marco Palladino. I am the CTO and co-founder of Kong. So let's take a look at why we need zero trust security. And then we'll fire up the terminal and see a live demonstration on how we can use a service mesh to enable it for us. Obviously, the world has entered a new era of software. We are distributing and decoupling our software in order to create products faster, in order to be able to scale our teams, in order to be able to ship every day. As we transition them to microservices, we are increasing the number of connections that we are creating across all the services that our teams are building. This is a chance for us to improve security as we transition to microservices. You heard right. This may seem counterintuitive at first. How is it possible that transition to microservices is a chance for us to improve security? Obviously, the more services we have and the more connections we have and the more insecure our infrastructure is going to be. Well, not really. With microservices, we can actually provide more secure perimeters across our services in a way that our monolithic application cannot do. Let's explore why. So first and foremost, let's talk about zero trust. The concept of trust is exploitable. As a matter of fact, the concept of trust is exploitable not only with our systems, but with human behavior as well. In order to create secure systems, we must remove the concept of trust in such a way that Nothing relies on trust, but everything is explicitly validated and identified. Let's make an example. Our world has been running with the concept of zero trust in other areas that are good examples for us to really understand how we can translate this behavior within our, within our systems. For example, um, imagine entering a new country without using a passport. The immigration officer without a passport would essentially have to trust us that we are who we claim to be. And sooner than later, somebody will exploit this trust and a lying criminal will enter the country illegally with malicious intentions. Since trust is exploitable because we cannot just believe that people or services are who they claim they are, we must remove the concept of trust. Therefore zero trust as in there is no trust involved in our security systems and this is why when we enter a new country we must present a passport that validates and identifies our human identity without any form of trust involved other than formally checking that the passport and the picture in the passport is of ourselves there is no blind trust that is required by the immigration officer. And likewise, when we travel, we have a passport that unequivocally certifies our identity. Our services must also present a virtual passport, if you wish, to other services when they make a request in such a way that we make sure that whenever a request is being sent out by a service, we can identify with certainty that the originating client, the originating service making the request truly is 
who they claim they are, without having to rely on trust. Assigning an identity to our services truly is the first step for us to be doing all sorts of other uh, security policies and permissions on top of this identity. When we want to say, when we want to implement a rule in such a way that one service can make a request to this service, but not this other service, all of these permissions and all of these rules are built on top of an identity backbone that removes the concept of trust and provides these virtual passwords to our services. Today, we're going to be seeing how we can assign this identity to our services in an automated way using a CNCF project called Cuma, uh, which is an open source service mesh that will implement zero trust across all the services and the workloads that we have running in the organization. Containers, Kubernetes, but also virtual machines or bare metal, potentially. In the real world, the identity is being given by a passport, a paper passport. But in microservices, this identity is being provided by TLS certificates. By creating an identity bound to a TLS certificate, and then making sure that whenever we send a request, it is encrypted with that identity, we can then verify the, um, the, the identity of our services, and on top of that, create our secure infrastructure. Essentially, we need virtual passports for our services. And let me tell you why in a more practical example. In a monolithic application, like the one that we're seeing now, every resource that we create can be accessed indiscriminately from every other uh, class or object via function calls. Since they're all part of the same code base, potentially everything can consume everything else. Our resources are going to be encapsulated into objects if you use uh, object-oriented programming that will expose initializers and functions that we can invoke to interact with them and change their state, among other things. And to give a simplified example, if we're building a marketplace application like Amazon, right? This is a very simplified example. We're going to be having resources that identify our users and resources that identifies the items that we're selling. And once we sell them, the invoices and so on and so forth. Typically, this means that we're going to be having objects that we can use to either create, delete, or update these resources via function calls that can be used from pretty much anywhere in the code base. And while there are some ways where we can re reduce the visibility um, or the invocation for these functions, typically, these practices are not strictly enforced by the teams and by all means are not secure. They're always one comment away from being removed. I'm talking about public, private, or protected access, um, you know, level visibility for our objects, and so on and so forth. In a monolith, the good mindset to adopt, it is that essentially everything can, can access everything else. And even the access modifiers that are in place are really easy to, to change. And in, in, in essentially, that sense of security is, is a false sense of security. And if they can be, be, disabled, be, be disabled, then everybody can do everything in this code base. When we transition to microservices, we have an opportunity to change that. We have an opportunity to actually implement better security rules via the adoption of zero trust that would render our applications more secure. With microservices, instead of having every resource into the same code base, we have those resources decoupled and assigned to individual services. Each one of them will expose an API that other services can consume. This means that instead of making a function call to access or change the state of our resources, we're going to be executing a network request instead. We are moving from the CPU, the function calls, into a network world, the API requests. Our resources can now interact with each other via service requests over the network, as opposed to function calls. The APIs can be RPC-based, they can be RESTful, you know, it doesn't matter how they're built. The point is the request is going over the network. And by default, this doesn't change our situation. Effectively, without 
any other barrier in place, every service could theoretically consume the exposed APIs of another service to change the state of every resource. But because the communication medium has changed and now it is running on the network, we can use technologies and protocols that operate on the network connectivity layer itself in order to enforce a stricter security and determine the level of access that each service should have with other services. In order to determine security rules over the network uh, with our services, we must typically do a couple of things. First, we must set up permissions. For example, these service can, the invoices service can, you know, query the item service, but not vice versa. And we have to check these permissions on every single request. Now, if we want to implement this check, you know, we can either ask the application developers to write code and every time they create a new service, they are going to be creating these security checks from scratch, or we provide the security layer on top of something else, something else that comes for free to the application teams in such a way that the teams can be focusing on building the service, but not necessarily on building the underlying security infrastructure, which quite frankly, it is not their job. But so here comes the problem, the biggest problem of all. Before we can even think about enforcing permissions, you know, this service can make these requests to these other service. As a prerequisite, we, we must have a reliable way to determine the identity of each service so that when we can make these requests and when we receive these requests, we can identify that the service truly is who they claim they are. Identity is essential. Without identity, there is no security. And in order for zero trust to be implemented, we must assign an identity to every service instance that will be used for every outgoing request. The identity will then act as our virtual passport for the request, confirming that the originating service um, is indeed who they claim they are. And in order to implement this zero trust security identity, we can use um, mutual TLS to provide both identities and encryption on the transport layer. And since every request now provides an identity that can be verified, we can then enforce permission checks with peace of mind. The identity of a service is being assigned by a subject alternative name or same of the originating TLS certificate associated with the request. As in the case of zero trust security enabled by a QMA service mesh, which we will explore shortly. SAN is an extension uh, to X509, the standard that is being used to create public key certificates, which allows us to assign custom values to any certificate. In the case of zero trust, the service name would be one of these additional fields that's baked into the certificate itself in such a way that when the, the receiving service uh, accepts the requests, we can decrypt that certificate and validate that the service name field is indeed accurate. And then on top of that service name field, implement our permission checks. Now, Implementing zero trust security is a must. Imagine building a microservice oriented application and not having this security layer in place. It would create an enormous risk to our applications and our business, but also it's quite uh, painful to implement because essentially every service in any language must implement a way to assign identities, check those identities, create permissions, check those permissions and so on and so forth. We don't want to build this from scratch in every service. Instead, we can use a service mesh like Cuma, which is open source, uh, an Envoy proxy. So Cuma supports Envoy as the data plane proxy technology to implement zero trust security that works out of the box, that's seamless and can be enabled in one click. And in the demo, I'm going to be showing you, it is literally one click. Cuma will then assign those identities. It will rotate the certificates. It will expire the certificate authorities in such a way that this entire life cycle is being taken care, of, uh, taken care of for us. We don't have to build it at all. Kuma is today being used by over 900 organizations around the world to implement a service mesh that's powerful yet easy to use. It's, um, it's a service mesh that supports 
Kubernetes, VMs, and you know any other containerized infrastructure like Fargate or ECS out of the box. It supports out of the box multi cluster, multi zone connectivity. It's multi mesh. Um, it's easy to use thanks to the concept of policies, policies for zero trust security, for example, but also traffic routing, traffic metrics, traffic logs, and tracing, and so on and so forth, fault injections. And, and we're going to be seeing in the demo truly how easy it is to get up and running with a multi cluster, multi cloud service mesh and enable zero trust security in one click. Now, before I do that, I just want to spend a few words on Kuma so that once we see the demo, we know what's happening. Kuma has been built um, really for scale. This is a product that has been created for the enterprise architect that must support all the application teams in the organization. Some of these teams are going to be running on Kubernetes, Kubernetes native policies. Some of them are going to be running on VMs. Um, different teams are at different stages of their journey. And sometimes we want to create a service mesh that can integrate with our legacy applications in such a way that we can leverage whatever existing IP it exists and integrate that with our new applications that are built microservices first. It's easy to use. It supports Kubernetes, VM, bare metal. It's multi-cloud, multi-cluster, multi-mesh. Um, there is lots of innovation that Kuma provides that other service meshes do not provide. And we're going to be also start, you know, looking at the quite unique deployment model that Kuma provides in the industry to tackle these use cases. There is a global control plane, which is the primary control plane. And then we're going to be having as many remote control planes for each zone that we want to support in our service mesh. Within each zone, can be a Kubernetes zone, a virtual machine zone, can be multi-cloud. We're going to be having services. And the services within the zone, they always connect to the control plane that's specific to that zone. This gives Kuma uh, the isolation and the compartmentalization that it needs in order to run a service mesh at scale in production. That entire policy propagation, reconciliation between the primary and secondary in the zone control planes, all of that is being taken care of, which means this is multi-cloud and multi-cluster by default. We can also have hybrid VMs and containers within the same service mesh. Then once we have deployed our service mesh, we can use either the CRDs, the CLI, the API, the built-in GUI to take a look into the service mesh and start using it. There is policies for all sorts of things, traffic routing, control, zero trust security, obviously, metrics observability that we can apply in one click on both VMs and containers. And there is lots of observability charts out of the box that are being provided by Kuma. 70 plus out of the box, as a matter of fact, uh, that work in, in both single zone and multi zone deployments. All right, so let's take a look at Zero Trust. Before I jump into the demo, I want us to look at this policy. This is the Zero Trust policy that we need to enable in Kuma to automatically provision a certificate authority. So we are creating, we are updating our default mesh with a mutual TLS backend of type built in. There is different types. We can provide our own certificates. We can connect, for example, with AshiCorp Vault, or we can ask Kuma to create the certificate authority for us. And whenever we do that, Kuma is going to be provisioning the root key and certificate for our mesh, and then it will automatically provision the data plane certificates that will be synchronized across all the Envoy proxies that we're running across the organization. We can specify a rotation, for example, every day and an expiration for our CA. This is the only thing that we need. Everything else is automated. The entire TLS lifecycle is being automated. The zero trust identity and encryption automated. This is the only resource we need to have to assign zero trust security to tens of thousands of services running in the organization. And then once we've done that, we can apply another policy like the traffic permission policy to determine what services can consume other services. And this is a very simple example that, it, well, in this particular example, we are allowing every source of traffic from any service to be able to consume every other service. Um, but we could limit this by country, by cloud, by environment. It's very flexible in the way we can implement these kind of policies. In Kong Mesh, which is a product that expands, it's the enterprise product that um, you know, one of the enterprise offerings on top of Kuma, we've also built a native open integration in such a way that we can leverage our identity 
to implement OPA rules without having to require an additional sidecar for running the OPA agent. No other service mesh allows us to do that. Cube and Kong mesh truly are the only ones. So let's look at the demo. Um, in the demo, I am going to be running uh, a few clusters in multi-zone. Uh, this is Google Cloud on GKE. Uh, as you can see here, we do have our global control plane running in central, then we have an east and west uh, control planes as well. But I also have a service mesh, the same service mesh, spanning across different environments on AWS EC2. So what we're looking here, it's a multi-cluster, multi-cloud hybrid containers and Kubernetes and VMs service mesh. The demo application that I've deployed, it's quite simple. It allows us to increment a counter on Redis. But because I have a Redis deployed in each one of these different clusters and zones, whenever we increment a Redis um, server, it tells us which Redis we're communicating to. So we can see this multi-zone connectivity happening in a secure way. All right, so let's connect to the global control plane in such a way that we can see what is the status of our service mesh. Let me make this bigger. There we go. And, um, and if you look at the namespaces, I'm running uh, this demo on a Kong mesh, but it is identical essentially for Cuma uh, when it comes to zero trust. Uh, we can explore our uh, pods and we can see that uh, we do have a control plane running. The control plane for Cuma and Kong mesh, it's a very simple service. We can scale it horizontally. Uh, it's very easy to use, easy to scale. All right, so let's port forward our control plane uh, in such a way that we can look at the GUI and the status of our mesh. So first and foremost, whatever the GUI provides, it is also being provided by an HTTP API. So we can integrate the system with any form of automation. Uh, but then if you go on slash GUI, you know, obviously the system also provides us with an out of the box GUI that we can use to um, manage the system. Well, so obviously here we do have a few services now. Uh, we do have our demo application. We do have Redis applications. We have three instances of each running on different zones on AWS EC2, GKE East and GKE West. Uh, we do have our data plan proxies connecting to the system, but guess what? Our zero trust is currently disabled. So let's see what happens when we start consuming our um, demo application. You know, we're going to be connecting to our EC2 instance. And when we increment the counter, it only increments within the same zone. Now, in order for us to enable zero trust, we must create that zero trust policy. So we can go on Kumo.io, we can explore the policies. Zero trust is only one of them. Uh, there is many others. And on every release, Cuma is shipping more policies that are super easy to use. But here, the mutual TLS one, uh, the demo that I showed you in my slide deck, uh, essentially was leveraging a built-in certificate authority to automatically create the CA and then, and then issue and rotate the certificates with our data planes. If we're running the global on Kubernetes, we're gonna be using kubectl. Uh, if we're running it on virtual machines, we can use kubectl. As you can see, there is no Kubernetes boilerplate. As a matter of fact, there is users that are using Kuma entirely on VMs, not on Kubernetes. But of course, this is a Kubernetes product as well. So let's go ahead and uh, create the command that I'm going to be echoing into my terminal to enable mutual TLS. So essentially, I'm going to be echoing this uh, policy in such a way that uh, I'm updating the default mesh with mutual TLS and we're enabling this built-in backend with rotation every day. When we do that, uh, I wanna have my demo application running on the side so we can see what happens. So essentially what we're going to be seeing here, it's something that's quite unique in the service mesh landscape because nobody provides this feature set that's so out of the box when it comes to multi-cloud, multi-cluster. Essentially we're connected to our global control plane so I'm now creating this policy. The global control plane accepts the request, propagates the CAs across every zone, issues the certificate to Envoy, and then once that is done, automatically our requests are going to be secure with mutual TLS. Not only that, they're going to be going in a multi-zone capacity across both containers and VMs. Essentially, service mesh creates an overlay across our deployment complexity, and uh, we can then manage it all from the global control plane. Now, if you go back to the GUI, 
uh, and we refresh the data, we see that we have our mutual TLS enabled. And if we go to the data point proxies, each individual data point proxy will now have a certificate insight that tells us exactly when the certificate has been generated. Now, on top of this, we can apply permissions. And these permissions uh, that we have today allow each service to essentially be able to communicate with every other service. But we could be removing this permission right now. So let me delete uh, my traffic permission. And if we do that, we would be stopping our traffic. But all of this runs on top of that zero trust security infrastructure that has been provided to you in one click. All right, so there is a, only a small time here to explore Kuma. I hope this was a good starter. Uh, and of course, if you have questions, there is a Slack chat uh, on kuma.io slash community where you can also ask any questions and get up and running with this. All right, so today we have explored why it is important to consider security when we are creating more and more services and as a result of that, more and more connectivity. Zero Trust becomes an opportunity for us to create more secure systems, but it is very hard to implement if we have to ask our teams to build it for ourselves. Instead, we want to give Zero Trust as a, as a, as a service, essentially, to the, to the application developers by using a service mesh like Kuma, which allows us to do that in one click across both Kubernetes VMs, across any cloud, any environment, including hybrid, like we've just seen. And the entire TLS lifecycle is being taken care of uh taken care of for us so, so it's it's truly self-service all right uh we can download kuma.io uh kuma at kuma.io of course and if you're interested in the enterprise offering uh, for kong mesh uh you can also go on konghq.com slash kong mesh to learn more like i said this is built on an open source foundation kuma it's a cncf project if you have any questions feel free to ask in the slack chat or